Okay, this is episode 26 of Counterpoints. Two-man operation again. We're back. A lot to discuss, actually, this time, because obviously there's been a while off. I've, been, I've had a little holiday after E-League because it was such a heavy-duty season. So, actually, we have to start with E-League, which is because, obviously, we haven't discussed the results of it. I mean, it seems like a while yeah. ago to me and you because, like, they literally had an event since then. We had ECS. And obviously, the problem we have is when you do actual shows and you do the analysis on the show and you do interviews and stuff, you all, you almost forget. You think like, well, I've already talked about all that. But actually, technically, for this show, we have never talked about the outcome of the results of the playoffs of E-League Season 2. So let's just start at the top, since obviously it's going to be relevant when we talk about ECS as we go on, since we have that wonderful rematch, which is <clears throat> Optic Gaming win the whole playoffs. So I want to ask you this question, okay? When that playoff bracket was set, and if you remember, the way I thought of it was, it was like everyone looked at those matchups and they were like, three of these matchups are awesome. Dignitas SK, Astralis yeah. Nip, Phase VP, and then everyone who looked at Optic Mouse, everyone was just saying, actually, first of all, everyone I know said Mouse would win. And then secondly, the second thing they said was, who cares anyway? That's the team that's going to lose to VP. And that's the one matchup that no one cares about. That's, that was basically the, the gist of pretty much every expert, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, That. I mean, the funny part about it was like, all four of the matchups in the quarterfinals were like really close, like hard to hard to kind of predict who would win them. Um, I think actually VP versus FaZe was the one that most people was like 100% that VP would win. I don't know, actually, to be completely honest with you, and this is going to sound crazy considering everything that's occurred, but I had Optic beating Mouse Sports. Um, and uh, But I mean, I don't think anyone had anyone going past that. Either no matter who you had winning that matchup, yeah, it was this is the team that will lose to Virtus Pro. This is the team who is going to just have a bid to get embarrassed by VP. Um, but but yeah, I mean it, it was a good showing. Even even with those two teams being obviously the weakest of the top eight at the time going into it, um, it definitely looked like it would be a close matchup considering neither of them had shown too much in terms of consistency. Um, but no one expected them to go to the finals. That's an insane actual <coughs> progression from from Optic, which obviously is one of the interesting factors because they didn't play VP now. I actually feel like this is an example of where I already know fans will get butt hurt, but they just have to accept it. Well, they don't. They can complain, but this is just reality. So if you remember, famously, when Luminosity won MLG Columbus, <clears throat> we did all have to kind of say, yes, but you can't ignore the fact that Guardian, Olaf Meister have these injuries, you know. Like, it doesn't mean you didn't win. I mean, you can only beat whoever's in front of you. But yeah. the point is, it's not like you were so exceptionally good that we know you would have beaten them as well. So unfortunately, there's this scenario with Optic, which is... Beating Mouse Sports, okay, if that's all that had happened and then they did play Virtus Pro, then fair enough, right? You know, you can't complain with that. But the reason they got to play FaZe is that FaZe themselves had a very narrow upset of Virtus Pro. If you remember both those maps that FaZe won were like super close. Yep. So then they got to play FaZe in the semis. And yeah, here's the thing. I certainly expected FaZe to beat Optic, but it's not as ridiculous if Optic beats FaZe. Like, you know, let's face it, FaZe is a team that's barely played any big best of threes and won them with Carrigan. You know, it's, it's a different matter. The difference is Virtus Pro is like... That that's just even mentally, that's a big task to go against. So, what did you think of Optic even beating Phase and going to the final? Yeah, I, I had Phase <coughs> winning that as well, especially after an upset over over VP. I, I think the big thing was, um, I mean, uh, Optic just looks very deep right now, and I think the big thing that they had was they came out and had a game plan, and then the play style they had. I think that's the biggest hitch right now for for someone like Phase and even Astralis to a certain degree, who they meet in the finals. We can get to that later, but I think I think there is a certain amount of a tough part when your new player is the in-game leader, especially with a team like FaZe, who's relying on Kerrigan to a massive degree, because we've we've seen what they look like without him. Um, if if something's not working, that that's kind of the thing where going into that with a young team with a new in-game leader they haven't had for a very long time, that's when the adaptation struggles. That's when it's hard to kind of understand how you want to adjust your defense or your offense to kind of match what your opponents are playing. Um, that's where it gets a little bit difficult. Um, but but altogether, I mean, with the way that Optic played that series, I'm not sure it would have even mattered. Um, that that was just one of those series from Optic where. I mean, even this whole playoff run they had was just like the the skill level that they all hit. They all kind of seemed to be peaking throughout this bracket. So, um, it, I mean, it was an incredible run, and that went over phase. I'm just amazed that they were able to match the skill level, and not only that, but they kept Rain down, who has been one of the more consistent stars we've had uh, when he's when he's on point. Uh, the fact that I thought Rain had a very bad series, and that that obviously can't fly for a team like Phase. Okay, yeah, I mean that's that's the problem for me is that. 
you looked at it and you were like, okay, sure, phase is, I, I don't think they're world beaters yet. Like, I thought they got a little bit overhyped, yeah. you know, with the runner, Elkland and stuff. But I definitely looked at them and I was like, now they're very dangerous because the key thing is they have in game leadership. And now it seems like, you know, some of those stars are getting unlocked. So yeah. that's where you figure that's what's going to be tough for an optic. Or, oh, by the way, if Cloud9 had got against them, I'd say the same thing, you know. Cloud9, yeah. you're going to need sort of those three stars that, in theory, have the potential. They're all going to have to go ham. And here's the thing, they did. So fair play, you know, like basically exactly the three that you'd need in theory <clears throat> for Optic to do well, Mixwell, Tarek, they're a must, and then Rush. Like if you get those three, you got a good shot. But that's what's interesting is when we go into the final, I think that's a very interesting kind of like way to set up the win conditions for Optic because I have to say, listen, they won the final, congrats. They beat Astralis, who's a very good team. But you have to start out again in a weird way and say at the beginning, even though we all know now because we know what's happened since that, yes, Astralis does go on to win ECS. Astralis is maybe going to be the best team in the world. All these things could happen. But at the time, again, if you get to the final and someone says you're going to play Astralis there and you look at the other side of the bracket, you're like, well, yeah, yes, please. You know, like this is a team yep. that hasn't won yet. You know, they're a team that still has issues. You know, they're, they're a new team themselves. Whereas like, you know, if you play SK, that's going to be tough. If you play Nip, I mean, yeah, that that was like even even in getting to the final, they had a weird opponent, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, and this is this is something where VPs got to be kicking themselves and being like, how badly did we fuck up this bracket yep. by by getting upset? Because this would have been obviously that that's like the dream route to the grand finals for for the team on that side of the bracket, especially yep. considering they were the by far the best team there. They like the highest ranked and everything. Um, so yeah, they've got to be upset. Um, the the crazy thing about the finals is it was like the opposite, where where against Phase it was like rain, rain went absent. Against Astralis, I didn't think anyone was necessarily absent from the Astralis side. Glaive had a pretty poor series, but you can forgive that as an in-game leader, uh, as a new one especially. It was actually the opposite in the sense that the Optic star, Naf, not even the star actually, just he had a, hit an insane series. Like, what are you going to do against someone who's playing like this? And it's not even like the stats, if you look at it, which he ended up with 78 kills across three maps, uh, 104 ADR for the series. So, I mean, even if you just watch that game, the impact he had, that's an insane performance. That that is that is one of those performances that you're not going to see very often. So, I mean, if if you're optic, you you got to be thanking Naf. If you're looking at this series, you got to be like, can't expect that every single time. But what what a time to have a monstrous game like that. Yeah, that's the big problem. That's where I have to take some issue with this final. Is that okay? Here's the thing. I will. I'll, I'll get okay. I'll to, first and foremost, what I'll do is I'll I'll give like a bit of. Uh, leeway okay so optic still could have done very well if mixwell and Tarek had played better that certainly could have happened right that's that wouldn't be unreasonable for mixwell or Tarek, one of them to have a much better game or both of them to play better like if you actually look at the stats for them the stats for them were kind of a bit average you know considering they're yeah. the star players so okay we'll say under normal circumstances that might happen more so it could have been close the problem is this naf performance is to me one of the biggest outliers i have ever seen in csgo because this is a guy who doesn't even have that kind of performance in a whole series if he's playing na teams online you know this doesn't happen in this guy's career so to have that sort of performance where you go super ham over the whole series every single map against elite level european competition when as we've kind of pointed out here you're not even a top three player in your team and yeah. you just take over the whole series. Like, unfortunately, that has never happened before for him. It's not. It's probably not going to happen again. That's the key point I'm kind of making. So listen, fair play. It happened this time. It's a perfect time to happen. Obviously, you won the tournament. You got this massive title. But that does make it a bit fluky the way you won the tournament, you know. The bad part about it is that if you the three people you'd expect on Optic to be able to carry a series or to do have a big performance to beat Astralis uh, or, or any any of the top teams really would be Rush, Mixwell, and Tarek, and they were the bottom three statistically in this in this in this series. Um, but I, but I will say that someone like Nath and even Stanislaw to a certain degree, where you kind of consider them more of the role players. They often get better within a team um, as it, once they start feeling very comfortable. Like that, that's kind of the thing with role players is once they, once you start getting experience with people around you, once you kind of know what you can expect or how your teammates are going to react in certain situations, role players oftentimes, once the team is playing well as a five-man unit, get better individually just because you know they're not creators. So someone like Tarek can create his own action. Someone like Rush can obviously create his own kill. Same with Mixwell. But Nath and Stanislaw have to kind of rely on as role players as those kind of glue players you could call them um, they kind of have to rely on knowing what their teammates are doing knowing what's going on around them and having the comfort in that communication to do better and I think that's that's the real 
that's the real reason why this optic team is playing so well at the moment is because Naf and Stan, this is the first time we've seen them apparently feeling this comfortable with a unit, with a lineup. Um, and that individual uh, <coughs> lineup that has increased for them is, is propelling this team to new heights. So, I mean, I will say that for Naf, I don't think this is going to repeat itself again either uh, in, in terms of his series. I don't think Naf's ever going to have this much of a domination. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, what is what is sick time to peak again? I mean, it's just it's just madness. Like, people have to realize those kind of stats aren't even just Game of Naf's life. Like, that would be, like, one of the best finals that, like, a Shocks would ever have, those sorts of stats, you know. Yeah. And now, listen, in terms of actually the stuff that did in the game, it would be different game impact, you know. Like, they as differences, a star player, like, different sort of roles, yeah. completely dominate the game, you know. But, but, you know, like, it's just very unlikely. So, as a result, that's why I'm saying this is a bit fluky. But here's the thing. I do think it's more like... If it happen, if Optic's going to win big tournaments in the future, it's going to be more the traditional route. So as we kind of outlined here, like here's the here's the here's the game plan I see for Optic winning tournaments. Okay, because <clears throat> I don't think it's going to happen often. I think it's going to be like Cloud Nine. I think it could happen every now and then, and that they'll just have the odd deep run as well. So what I think can happen is, <clears throat> first and foremost, you have to pretty much have Mixwell and Tarek do well. Like they're they're easily the two best players in the team. And they played the star roles. And you just look at the history of the team. You've got to minimum have one. And usually both. If you're going to beat the big European team, we'll look historically what they've done with upsets. So th that's the initial condition. And then the second one is, for me, in every big game, Rush will be the X factor. Because the idea is you expect those stars to play well. But the, if he turns up and does really well. Like, for example, if this final, like I'm kind of outlining, if this final had been Mix 1, Tarek played really well. And then Rush did what he did earlier in the tournament, you know, and had like a plus 20 series. Then I'd say, right, well, logically, I see why they won actually this makes sense you know there's something repeatable about this and then as a final issue i think the final win condition for me for optic is you've got to have like strong t sides like to me they're living and dying by t sides at the moment like that's that very is what, strong t sides that's what i think is gonna get, is gonna get them over the hump because it seems like they actually have Here's the thing. I don't think they're a T-side team in the sense of like, you know, oh, they're so tactical and they're so smart at reading the opponent. No, what I think they're very good at is I think they've attuned what they do on T-side to just the skill set of their players. So, for example, I've noticed whenever they do those crazy Tech 9 rushes, I don't think that's actually a very good strat the way they do it on a bunch of the maps, like on train, etc. But I will say the way they do it, like the pace that they use and like who explodes where and at what time just makes sense for the skill of the player that they've got in each position. That's why people like Rush that's why people like Mixwell get out into these good positions so that's actually a key thing because I've always said it's not about necessarily having the perfect style or you have like the best strats but you've just got to have the strats and the style that makes more sense to your team you know yeah, and I think I think it's I think it's very interesting too because their T side. I mean, Stan gave a good interview. I think it was either before or during ECS. Um, and this is a sentiment I've heard other players from other teams echo in the professional scene. Is Stan I, that the interview, the headline was like, um, "In game leaders try and focus too much on the tactics" or something along those lines. And basically, what his answer boiled down to was like, "Some some in game leaders are sacrificing too much individually for some level of tactics." Um, and he's he's talking about how he doesn't necessarily do that he's not trying to worry about all five players in the team he sets up a general concept and obviously lets trust his other teammates to make plays and he focuses a lot more on his individual style which obviously plays to the strength of someone who hasn't grown up in the scene and hasn't grown up in teams being an in-game leader but also it lends itself very very well to the current saturation problem in the scene where you have so many events you don't have a lot of time to do tactical innovation you don't have a lot of time to fine-tune these these executes and the different ways you want to take map control you, you basically it's it's much more loose style so at the moment um he's one of the in-game leaders who is not like a statistical liability in this team so i think that's a, that's a big boon as well i would agree with you to an extent about having needing the three people i actually you know with the example you just gave i would switch Tarek and rush i think more often than not that that Roptic is going to need rush and mixwell to play big and i think Tarek is just someone <coughs> who i think I think it feels like he takes more of like an entry role than Rush does. It feels like he takes more opening duels and he just needs to play, you know, above average. He just needs to win those more often than not, right? Because the entry fragger is always going to have those up and down games. The guys who are taking the initial action are always going to be a little bit inconsistent. So as long as Tarek has some good games here and there, I think they can get by without him having a good game every single time around. But he needs to be able to, to have does those it, explosive games. Does it tilt you at all, Moses, that about 16 months ago... 
we were talking to young Tarek and he was explaining to us, we were telling him, you should be an entry or a second entry with a rifle, you know, you'll be really good. He was telling us, no, I'm going to be a, the primary opera and a clutcher. And then, well, <laughs> you know, we see how the career played out. There's, we there's, were right, Moses. <laughs> there's a lot of things that, there's a lot of things that tilt me about this team. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, Mixwell still, the, that tweet after New York of wanting to be a secondary opera still blows my mind. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that thing about Tarek, that, I mean, I remember, I, was it, we, we talked about that with Hayes as well in that episode we did with Hayes yeah. and Shazam, I think yeah, it was. Shazam, yeah. Where Hayes was saying it's that hard to forget. Yeah. you know, luckily now this is what this is what an idyllic world we live in post Trump. That now it's easy to forget Shazam exists. Yeah, pretty soon there'll be a wall. Yeah, um, <laughs> my life. All right, Edgy, keep going. <laughs> a green wall. Keep going. No, but I think the best part about E League actually that you just reminded me the best part of E League, the absolute best part was when Rush got up in that post-game interview after winning the semifinals, was it? Or was it the grand? It, was, it had to have been the semifinals. And he just said, oh, man, the best decision we ever made was kicking Shazam. That was hilarious. What yeah. what an unbelievable thing to say in, like, a post-match. Like, you just won the semifinal of E-League, one of the biggest tournaments in terms of prize money, in terms of prestige, and your first thought is, thank God Shazam's not here. That's, that's unreal to me. I don't mind, but it's just hilarious. Yeah. And plus, like, as you're kind of referencing here in a joking mind, it's so it's totally the case. Like, Mixwell has to be the primary opera of this team. Like, yes, listen, Tarek can use the weapon sometimes. Naf can use it sometimes. But the difference is, Mixwell, he, it's funny, he reminds me of when Device did this as well. There was a period of time where Device was the primary opera of Astral, like, well, they were TSM back then, you know, last year. And then because they had a couple of tournaments where they didn't do so great, he wanted to, like, quit being the opera, you know? And it was like, listen, I get it that, like, because you're not, like, someone who's been an opera your whole career, you don't have it in your mind. Like, I have to have it every guy. Yeah. And obviously, the fear always is, is if you're having an off game with an op, you feel useless, you know? So you think, well, just give me a rifle. Like, I can do something, you know? The problem is, though, when you are the device or mix wall, you're so good with the op, and in so many ways, it's like yeah. you're just a better tool for your team if you use it. And so I think that's what actually both of them have found, funnily enough. Yeah, I mean, Nath and Tara can both get by with the op at times, obviously, when they're feeling it. Even Santa's lot ECS was using the AWP to good effect. But yeah, it is. I mean, there are just the primary operas have like a certain skill set that the, the like secondary operas just don't have. And Mixwell has that as well, where where he can he can duel against opening operas, just a better feel for how to use it in certain situations. So um, I, obviously, these past two events for me have really solidified that Mixwell has to be a primary opera. I think that, that that's a necessary component to this team. Um, and, and they've looked they look great with it ever since he's gone back to it after New York, after that short stint away. But it is kind of, it is kind of crazy that they have Naf, Stan and Tarek, who all have shown the ability to to be that secondary opera like that's a lot of that's a lot of versatility in this team uh, which is pretty nuts to think about because stan hit some crazy shots at ecs with it yeah actually one thing i want to mention about this tournament since obviously we're just passing over them virtus pro because they just went out so early and they didn't have any impact i think virtus pro has kind of fucked up the end of the year run because yeah I, here's the thing they all the events they were going to okay even this one so even their loss here where they didn't look as good still very very narrow you know like you know they yeah. could have won both those maps that phase one so really close so it says to me that vp in no way has like you know it's not like they've been toppled or they've become bad or whatever it's just that they've only played one tournament in like a month and a half or two months or something yeah. so bearing in mind they weren't at ecs anyway i mean they couldn't have known it at the time but they obviously didn't end up qualifying for ecs i th i assume that was their plan they thought well, we might get into ecs as you as well you know and therefore we'll be in elig and ecs so we'll have too much of a packed schedule unfortunately Actually, now that we know they didn't get an ECS and it was just E-League or Bust, basically, they've kind of fucked up because they've relinquished the number one spot. They haven't played for a long time, all just because they tried to take this break, you know. And so everyone was kind of applauding them. <clears throat> yeah, great, great job taking time off. But I think it's kind of bit them in the ass inadvertently, you know. Yeah, I will. I think that, I think that's the interesting thing because teams like um, teams like Dignitas, who have basically been at events for like seven or eight weeks straight, or seven out of eight weeks, or whatever it's been, um, it almost seems like too much for that team. But someone like Virtus Pro, I, I remember talking to them um, or a couple of the guys right when they got to Atlanta for the E League playoffs, and and they they mentioned that they were worried about the fact that they'd taken so much time off because they said they're one of the teams who I think they all they all think to a certain degree they have to like play themselves into shape. They have to keep active so when they were when they were gone for so long it was what they hadn't been doing events since epicenter i think it was they hadn't done like basically anything except for maybe some online ecs games um so that really showed i thought they did seem a little bit rusty they didn't seem to have that that consistency that that good team 
team mesh that they'd had for for so long towards the end of the year. Um, so yeah, I mean they they definitely relinquished that number one spot, not by necessarily having any bad results, although E League wasn't obviously great, but just by the sheer fact that they were not active for like four or five events for like a, maybe a, yeah, like you said, a month and a half. So um, that's something that's going to be interesting because going into the major, I think they're they're one of the teams that's going to WESG. So they don't have to be at the qualifier, but I mean they're they're going to that that event in China that's right outside yeah. Shanghai. So I mean maybe that's something where I mean I know they were just kind of signed up to it already, but that that might actually be a benefit to where a lot of teams I would say, what the fuck are you doing in China with like a thirteen hour time difference when you have to go to E League like the very <coughs> next week basically? For that seems a little bit crazy. Yeah, for the major, um, they're one of the teams who I think that could actually benefit. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean the interesting thing is okay. <clears throat> the other team I wanted to talk about in uh, E-League before we go to ECS is <clears throat> SK Gaming because obviously it actually ended up being extra. There was a, there was two key things about this E-League run, which is that SK still looked how they've looked for the last three months. You know, they look like a pretty solid team. They're still world class. They're tough to beat, but they don't win the tournament, right? And mm -hmm. the key thing for me that's kind of fitting is that obviously this lineup's now broken up. And then they literally broke up after ending the train streak. They lost on us to Astralis on train. The one team, by the way, who looked like even threatening them on the map, you know. They yeah. lost to them, and then they literally just broke the team up. So here's the thing. As much as I hate to see, like, really good teams, because they were still a fantastic team to watch, as much as I hate to see that happen, I kind of do get the logic. Like, I here's the thing, okay. If you think about how many past episodes I've bemoaned people like NIP, G2, where they have good teams, but I always feel like they're one player away, you know. Like they're, they're, yeah. they're, their problem is they're relying on their 10 out of 10 level day where they look really amazing and thinking, right, well, I can get to that every day. And it's like, well, you can't, mate. What you've got to do is you've got to have a team that's good enough that you, you can have like a 7 out of 10 day. And maybe if you went, you could still win the tournament somehow, you know. That's how you become a champion. So one thing I'll say for SK is, listen, I think this tournament, this team could have still kept going to events and getting top fours and having close. Yep. And, you know, maybe they would have won one. Like, yeah, they, obviously that could happen. Optic can win an event. SK SK could win an event for sure. It's just that they would never be the world number ones again. Like, they don't be a champion. I mean, I realize everyone's going to say, well, they were a world number one story. Yeah, only in this weird era where, like, everyone wins different events and everyone goes to different events and, you know, like, stuff that we've never seen in Counter-Strike before. So I actually kind of applaud the fact that they realized, like, you know, that run's done. Like, let's just make... A, well, I mean, they haven't made the move yet because they've just got Fox as a stand-in. But we've yeah. got to start putting in place, you know, the process that gets us to one day be the best team again. Yeah, it actually... I mean, I... I, I... I don't like the Fox pickup, not because it's Fox, but they can't fucking do anything until after the major, right? Yeah. They can't pick up who they want. So yeah. it's like there there's has to be some like some like crazy crazy personal issue going on there with them and F and X where it's just not you can't even make it work for another month because why not just keep the guy you've played with for a year? Because now you have a new player, Fox, who you're trying to integrate at least well enough to to get to top eight at the major. That's got to be the goal for this team is get top sure. eight um, just to be able to be legend <coughs> for the next one because now we're seeing how intense these qualifiers can be. But if you have FNX, you know that you, even despite the issues, you're still making top four. So why not just keep him for the major and then make the swap afterwards? Because obviously the, the, the most logical bet is that Phelps is coming in from Immortals and they just can't do it at the moment. So why are you now trying to integrate Fox, who I think is a lesser player than FNX. Um, and on top of that, now you have to start adding him into roles and switching things around to be effective enough to get that top eight. So I don't understand the logic behind the move at this point. I like I like the idea that they say top four is not good enough for us. That that's I like that a lot, obviously. Um, but the the timing of this just seems a little a little weird to me. So I mean, it, there's something going on behind the scenes. And obviously, um, Fur was very outspoken about that. And yeah, you got to respect that kind of opinion where he was just like, we're going to keep these issues within the team. Um, we're not going to talk about them. That's between the players and the squad that have been together for so long. So um, no big deal there. But there, there has to have been some massive, massive problem that they could just couldn't put up with for any longer. Yeah. I also just think it's kind of, <laughs> I, I think that just for the storyline, it's kind of awesome that the way the train streak ended was the Astralis team getting it done yeah. because obviously they were the ones who'd come close before. Yeah. They're a team where actually you look now, now that SK has gone, they've got the best train. I mean, you, you just have to say it flat out. Like I think train and overpass, they're just monsters on those those two maps. You know, like the, they're, they're the two that they're going to like build their chance to be number one on, I think. Yeah, and the crazy part is SK has gone the... I mean, their train is still obviously going to be very, very good. Um, I, I even think it's still going to be like a top top three train in the world. The problem is, I don't... Where do they go after this? 
because it seems like they're starting to they're starting to favor cash a little bit. Um, I don't think their overpass is that good just because their T side is so weak. Their T sides on overpass have not been very strong lately. It's their CT side that's been carrying them. Their dust too is still kind of iffy. They have some confidence in it and it's not bad for them, but they're no longer, I mean, they're, they're just no longer don't have really have any kind of a deep map pool whatsoever, not even close to it. Um, yeah. So that, that's the worry for SK. Well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. For SK, it's not even just the Fox pickup. Like, the Fox pickup is a problem, right? Fox is not a good player. And I'll, but I will say this. I don't necessarily blame him for whatever happens in SK. It's not his team. He's just playing it as yeah. a stand-in. But the problem is, even as a stand-in, he's not going to do well. Like, he actually had terrible stats at EZS. And so my issue with it is, <clears throat> I'm sure he can do an okay job, right? Like, as in, he's not going to do a good statistical job, but maybe he can just do what they ask him to do in the team, right? My problem is, even the old SK, I already saw having some flaws and i think a lot of what won, some, won them some of those series was just like i call it like veteran savvy it's like the idea that like for it, it sounds weird but it's like the concept of like what do you do if you're not hitting your shots is there a way that i can still impact the game can i play more aggressively here can i set my teammate up better who is going on the you know that sort of yeah, stuff yeah. that you only sort of learn when you've either had the team together a long time or you've played a long time and you're like a, a top player you know so that's what i think i think they they kind of like <clears throat> use that to get through some of those games it's the same as this okay there's like a joke that people always have in the basketball community that if you ever go to the park and you see like an old man there who plays pickup basketball if you ever play that guy one-on-one -on -one, you'll think to yourself i'm gonna wreck this guy you know this guy's like 40 years old like you know i'm like a young buck in my prime like 25 but you won't because what will happen is that guy knows exactly how to play around his strengths and he knows he's not mega athletic so all he's gonna do is do stuff like figure out like when he, which way you drive and try and steal the ball from you or he's gonna like bump you a bit when he's like posting up you know in a way that like yeah if there was a real ref he'd call a foul yeah. but no one's gonna call a foul but you know it's that sort of stuff where he knows like the little corners you can cut it when you really need to just to edge your win and you know that's what and that's kind of what i think sk was doing so i kind of agree with you for me their map pool had gone to shit that's why when i made that article saying like it was the yeah. end of their era i put i pointed out like you know when they were dominant they had an amazing map pool but their map pool has gotten worse and worse and they were at the point now where they needed that train to even yeah. get to three maps to lose a series that's what was so mad about it you know yeah like that they, they, like remember they had a 17 game winning streak well, something like, you know, 10 of those were during the period they weren't winning tournaments and yet they never lost on train and they weren't <clears> winning tournaments. So that to me was already an indictment. If your biggest strength isn't winning your tournaments, then your weaknesses are killing you, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, they, and that, 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 looks, that looks atrocious at the moment. So that's something they'll have to work on. And obviously they're going to be in that same boat as like Astralis was in the last major, NIP was at Columbus, where it's just like make top eight, avoid avoid the qualifier, don't have to go through that process, uh, just just make it as a legend. So um, th that'll be interesting to see if they're able to do it uh, moving forward. But yeah, their map pool is going to be a critical problem. I think, think is, though, that's all they can do, though, I think. like Here's yeah. the thing, I'll, I'll give them credit because I still think they've got a good unit. I do think they could make top eight of the major. The yeah. problem is I don't think they can go further. Like, I don't think it can make any run because once you get to a best of three, man, people are going to pick their weaknesses apart now in the map pool, I think. Yeah, um, but I mean, thankfully, they have a guy like Cold who can carry these games, who's extremely consistent. They he have has a guy been going like ham, yeah. Yeah, and they have Fallen as well, who hasn't been as consistent as Cold has, but he still has those explosive games, especially on... He's like he's one of those guys on certain maps where he's just like a god, like Overpass comes to mind. Um, so so they, have, they, they, have some good, they have some good tools to use. Um, the issue is, the, the problem is, and we've always talked about this on the show, is the way this team is structured and the system and the, 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 the tactics and the way this team is put together... This is not an easy team to just replace somebody. You can't. This is not a plug and play team. It's not like just you know put put a new player into the lineup and when you know just go at it. It's going to take time. So even even when they get someone from you know we all think it's going to be Phelps from Immortals. Even if that happens, it's not going to be like this return to dominance. So uh, that that's going to be that's going to be fun next year trying to see this SK team try and reclimb the ladder. No, that's the funny thing about the pickup is I totally understand why it will be Phelps if it is because obviously he's the one they haven't tried in the team yet. He's someone where maybe they would have tried in the past, but they say personality issues. Yep, they wanted he to. Ha he has looked like the best in Immortals. You know, all the pieces are there. My problem is if I just look at it role for role, I don't think it works actually. Like I don't think FNX and Phelps are at all similar. So my issue with that is I think to make it work, you have to rejig the team. And so when I think of how the team's set up at the moment, I see it as being the person who's going to have to sacrifice his fur. Because for me, Fur and Phelps are like aggressive players that you put in these playmaking positions, you know. So I feel like 
if, like if you wanted to just pick up someone who's just like FNX, the problem is it's bolts. But they already had bolts in the team, and I think they're not yeah. going to go down that route again, unfortunately. So they're not picking up like this is what we need. This is the hole we need to fill, you know. And here's someone who fits it. And I think they're just thinking we're just going to get the best player we can, and then we're going to rework the team. I think that's the logic. So I expect if they do it, it'll be a different SK. I mean, yes, it'll still be the Fallen and Cold Zero show, that's for sure. But I think the rest of it will have to change. And I'll give credit to Fur. I know he can change his roll-up, because yeah. he definitely did that when Cold Zero first came in the team. But I also do feel like he had settled back into a really nice role, considering he didn't get to be the star anymore. I thought they really had a good space carved out for him. So I want to see what that dynamic will be like. I mean, listen, if they win, it won't matter, you know. People can put yeah. up with playing bad roles. It's just that that's one of those things where it's not, it's not as simple as people might think to figure that sort of balance out. <laughs> no, it's not at all. And like you said, if it doesn't work, <laughs> then, then that's when it starts getting really interesting. If it's like a month or two where it's just obviously not working and they keep sliding or they don't improve, that's when you're going to see someone like Fur be like, all right, guys, like, give me give me some of the aggression back. Yeah, Let's exactly. get back to the old ways. So, yeah, that, that's going to be cool um, to watch for sure. Uh, okay, so let's talk about ECS then. Because yeah. obviously the interesting thing about ECS was well, we had Astralis, we had SK, we had Dignitas, we had Optic Phase. These teams were all there again. But the caveat was, and by the way, this actually killed the hype of this event for me, is that we knew both Dignitas and SK had stand-ins. Now, in SK's case, the reason why it was still doable to look good is because it was FNX for Fox, and FNX had been underperforming, and Fox was just going to play a role, you know? The problem is it's the Dignitas one that killed it for me. You can't take out Magic's boy out of Dignitas, expect him to do well. I mean, listen, I'll give them as much credit as they can. Yeah. Valde is about as close as you can get to Magic's boy, and they even have, like, vaguely similar styles, you know? But there's just no one... Like, unless you literally are going to borrow device or something from Astros, you're just not going to get a player like Magic's boy. He's too good at the moment, and especially too integral to that team. Yeah, no, he's huge. And I mean, and we, we knew this, and this is one of those things as well. Um, I think it's hilarious. They didn't even find out they qualified for the, the, this event until they landed. They were on like an like a international flight. I think it was coming back from DreamHack um, to the to the E-League playoffs, and they didn't even know if they were going to go to ECS afterwards. They didn't know if they qualified yet. So, Oh, by the way, I've got a question to ask you, Moses, before I forget. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it you who said something like that? Uh, I think it was you who said publicly that they had tried to get Pimp, but they had been denied by the the player group, right? Didn't you make a tweet about that? No, it wasn't me, but but that that was confirmed to be true. No, but this is the problem. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm certain, I can't remember who it was though. Someone made like a tweet or a post about that and someone like replied, I think maybe from Dignitas or some team saying, you're wrong, that's a, that's a lie. And then it was confirmed to be true later. Do you know what I mean? Do, do, you, remember, do you remember this happening roughly? I know. I, I remember the, I remember hearing about it. I don't remember who tweeted it. And maybe, then I maybe I've got just, it wrong there, right? I just, see it, I just saw it confirmed in an interview they gave where they were very, I mean, so one of the players was open. I forget who it was. I don't know if it was, might have been. Config. Was it Config? He the one yeah. who confirmed it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because that, that would have been the logical thing, right? Like, not having to fly someone else over, just grab someone who's, by the way, the liquid house is in SoCal. So it's like, this is this would be easy. Um, yeah, weren't able to do that. Uh, the Players Association, I think, blocked it just because he'd, been, he'd already played for a team during that league. So, um, yeah, that, that happened. But either way, I mean, you got to be happy with someone like Valdi coming in and standing in. Um, but, but regardless, I mean... You, you kind of got the sense for Dignitas where once once you realize that they wouldn't even have Magis Boy at this event, again, this is a situation where for me as a former player, I am just saying, why are you guys even going to this event at this point? Go home for a week, go relax, boot camp, like just chill, go and like take three days off. I don't know, do something um, where, where it's just like, this is too much because I think that that was, that was, this is part of their like seven week stretch and now they're ending it here on, on the major qualifier. So um, a lot of time, I just was back doing schoolwork. Now he's going to be back in the roster. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there was just, there was a lot of reasons why some of the hype around this. And I think were D Dignitas and SK were both in the same group, weren't they? Where they both had stand-ins. Oh, I found it. I f by the way, uh, Dignitas and SK, yeah, they were. But I, I've just actually found what it was. It was DK. Okay, so NWDK is his Twitter name. He's obviously the guy who breaks all the news. He yeah. said on December 5th, Dignitas originally tried to grab Pimp for the ECS finals, but the ECS council voted against it. Thus, they asked Valde. And Rubino from Dignitas says, that's actually not true. And now, here's the thing. He did do the little Thorin beak smiley face, so he might have been fucking with everyone because someone from his own team confirmed it. 
Listen, like everyone knows understand. what that means at this point in time. <laughs> Dude, I did a tweet the other day. Did you see it? I like retweeted someone. I can't think. Oh, it was that Jordan Peterson guy. You know that guy who's doing all that social justice warrior, anti-social yeah, justice yeah. warrior shit. He did the little beak face when he's talking to someone and he did it in the same sort of context that I would use it. So I don't know if I've influenced him through like advanced memetics or something, but yeah, it, yeah. I've, I've changed the world, mate. I'm the reason Brexit and Trump <laughs> happened. That beak face. It's that is all you. That is a slap to the totalitarian regressive left face <laughs> that is being presented to us now, Moses. Big face for justice. Oh, anyway, continue. Yeah. You're right, they uh, were both in the same group because they actually played each other together. Yeah, I mean, that that was the issue because that, that group at least looked like this kind of a little bit of a mini group of death before all these fucking yeah. standards happened. So, I mean, it was, sick, yeah. it was that group specifically where you're just like, well, that, that kind of lost a little bit of excitement to it. But, I mean, still obviously some, some, some interesting storylines and group play in in this event going into it especially considering with optic beating astralis at e-league and them being in the same group at ecs that's huge that's that's a cool thing to follow so um yeah that that group was a lot of fun in specific actually yeah well i mean that was actually the interesting part isn't it that over this tournament astralis actually beat optic three times because they beat them on three different maps i mean on dust two beat them on uh, what was it overpass and train so they played two of the three maps they played before and they played do- overpass as well so right I should just address the elephant in the room okay. because Come on. the uh, the the whole the, the the tweet fiasco that I had saying that Optic would not get out of groups at this yeah. event okay the Th- I, I saw your logic your logic made yeah, sense no that's the thing that's that's what bothers me because it was so close to coming true Cloud9 bodies him on the first map Moses I am someone who was two rounds from having a, literally a prediction that the entire world told me was impossible and being able to get my dick and wave it in everyone's face. As I have learned, Moses, you know the old saying, a miss is as good as a mile. No one gives a fuck, I'm afraid. I wish they did, Moses, but sadly, you get zero credit. No, okay, so explain your reason then. Come on then. It was just so, well, I mean, obviously going into a B1 with Astralis, I, I, I just took Astralis to win that. So the, logically, after that first match against Optic, they dropped down to play Cloud9 who they have lost, I think it was like seven games on land previously to Cloud9, okay. like Cloud9 had beat him. Not to mention, they beat him in a best of three, they crushed him in a best of three, a DreamHack winner. And the event previously where they played him, where they beat him again, was like the week or two before that even. I, I can't exactly remember which event that was. Um, but I, I mean... Uh, just, Pro League. What's that? They beat them at Pro League. Yeah, yeah, at Pro League and then and then at DreamHack winner. Like, both yeah. and Beth, both and Beth the threes, and, and both just crushed them. I mean, it wasn't even a close series. So, I mean, the, the they were up 12-3 on the second map after they crushed them on the first map and somehow choked that one away. That was unreal. And, and the aftermath of that, it was just, like, scorched earth, man. Like, the, I, I feel like I got, like, a, a, a one, one to two-day glimpse of what it's like to be in your life with... with <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? With TSM fans yeah. and Brazilian... Like, it was just... It was outrageous. I can't well, even... the, secret, the secret that I've done, Moses, that people don't understand is if you're in one game, okay, the idiot fan base in that one game will go in on you. So, for example, you know, SK Gaming stands will just go ham on you, you know, idiots from Brazil. But what I've done successfully is I've gotten... I'm in so many different games. I've gotten the hate of all the fans from all those games, all the idiots in every game, and I channel it all towards myself like a lightning rod, and I power up as a result. I, like, transcend to a new level of memes, and I just go fucking ham. And they don't realize this, Moses, but you you know this is the way I work. I'm like the fucking X-Men character bishop right where if he, oh, what yeah, he does yeah. is his ability is he absorbs energy that you fire at him so the more energy you fire at me the more powerful i get so when you fire all this hit at me i just body your team 10 times harder next time they haven't figured that out yet still yet they don't, they don't know that's the way the, they're making the feedback stronger this works. Whole time. yeah exactly if you strike me down moses i will <laughs> I like I, the the worst part about it was that the after after Optic qualified for the group stage, every every time Optic won a map in the playoffs was like a new round of like fucking just hate and vitriol spewed my direction. Okay. And it was it was Hitch. It was that Optic Hitch who did it. He retweets that okay. tweet right after they yeah. qualify. He's like the Dennis Nedry of esports. He takes down the security, he yeah. takes out all the fences in the park, lets the dinosaurs loose, and then just fucking strolls or tries to stroll out. I mean, he pitch got away, Dennis didn't. Yeah. Um, but you know, he takes everything down. Suddenly didn't like, have the same guys. end with, yeah. uh, as Dennis Nedry. But, yeah, well. this one could have gotten better. This one definitely could have gotten better. Well, I feel like Hitch, 
you know, we could obviously change one letter in his name and more properly describe him. So, not bad. Okay, right. Okay, I've got a question then before we go on to yeah. the playoffs of this tournament. So, one thing you have to say, okay, and ever, this storyline got completely lost. But if you remember, everyone probably thought I was just going super ham on Cloud Nine after Oakland, where I was just pointing out, like, you know, aside from Pro League, they've bombed all these tournaments. They've done quite badly, you know, like they had, they weren't what everyone thought they were. I mean. When you consider all the standings in this tournament, blah, 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 like coming last place at this tournament is pretty whack, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think I think Cloud Nine's at a point. And the, the tough part about it is like you don't even see any. And this is this is kind of some of the criticism that we've had, even when Cloud Nine has had success. Um, uh, that we've had the criticism that we've had of this team is they only seem to really have that one style that that relies a lot on Stewie and relies a lot on automatic. They don't really have anyone out outside of that that's going to create something that that they can focus strats around. You know, Skadoodle's not the kind of opera at the moment that you can base a tactic around the way that Navi used to do with Guardian, or you know, you can rely on him to get a pick. Um, so, so that's the scary part. And, and the thing is, they haven't changed anything. Um, we even said after EPL, I think, that that win was actually going to to be a detriment in the long run because that that makes it seem like whatever they're doing, the way they're playing, is working and it's successful, and it's not. Um, so. It's, it's become very apparent they don't have another style that and Stewie doesn't have the experience not only as a leader but like remember we've said this a lot and let's just remind everyone he only really started competing in professional counter-strike in january so i, I mean not only new to in-game leading especially a team at this caliber but just a counter-strike in general like very very new so how is he going to switch things up how is he going to be in practice and be like this is this is the change i want to start making this is the direction this team needs to start heading this team needs a coach um and, and the big thing now with how well optic's been playing in these past two events and the, how bad cloud nine has played ever since epl is is now you look at this major qualifier and you you say you know what if cloud nine doesn't like they might they might already be there i think you need like one more result to really seal it but optic is probably the best team in north america that that's yeah. the crazy part cloud nine is now like especially with the with the significance of the finally optic beating cloud nine in a series um they might have just taken the crown plus when i look at the cloud nine guys i actually feel like even the whole thing about automatic didn't live up to the billing like autumn if you remember if we look at automatic's time in cloud nine his first few months he was good and he wasn't some god and then he had epl and then he had im masters so that like okay i i, I buy power masters those two tournaments he went super ham it's not like he's bad now he's just come back down to earth he's just back to being like a solid player who works pretty well in the team you know and so the problem i see with them as a team is still they don't really it's not like they have the sickest lineup and then their map pool now is shrunk to it's not existed you know like they've got a couple of maps i mean they're play. picking they're picking dust two and their dust two is actually in my opinion strategically horrendous so it's like um take from that what you will but that should not be their map pick like i actually feel like i mean I, I've, I've said this many times before you know about the lifespan of a team and how long before you do a roster move and again my my theory that like after like three lands you know what a team's like I feel like this is a great example of it because here's the thing. Cloud9 is not a bad team. They absolutely could qualify for the major. They could even like, you know, make, who knows, if it went really well, they could make like top four at the major. That could happen, right? I, I would bet against it, but it could happen, right? That's the problem though. We kind of know what the variance is for this team now. We know what a bad day looks like. We know what a really good day looks like. And we know what the middle day looks like. And at the moment, the middle day for this team, for me, is to be like a fifth to eighth type team if you're in a big tournament, you know. It's not going to be to win unfortunately like yeah. pro league was a bit miraculous and it did have factors like you know no voters pro no navi etc etc but i just don't that's the problem i feel like they've capped out and i don't see where they improve without a roster move right now yeah no i don't well i, I mean the first the first thing i know a lot of people are leaning to and i'm actually i i mean i was saying this a while ago right around the epl time was that they need a coach I'm almost, I'm almost past that. I'm almost just saying, skip the coach portion. Go get, go get. I mean, you need a roster change. Even with the coach, I don't, I don't know if there's going to be the willingness to, to adapt from some of these players because they haven't shown it yet. Sure. Um, and then that's, that's kind of the tough part. Yeah, and, and if you look at automatic, he's. I mean, the big thing was I remember when we had Steel on, and, and Josh said that, um, that automatic was, was one of those players who like benefits very much from the fact that the players around him aren't, aren't as bad as they were, you know, in, in TSM. He doesn't have players who are all he's rushing and just dying very early on so automatic can actually just sit back and this is his actual skill level he's just in a system that's more comfortable i think cloud nine is just entirely entirely lucky that automatic hit that peak right around epl because i mean even if you look at his stats now i mean yeah. right around that i mean there was like a 
12 game stretch where he only had like one negative rating or two negative ratings out of 15 games and now if you look at it it's just scattered in there with red and black and yeah that doesn't tell the whole story but i mean automatic has never i, I mean we, we've that, that was the crazy thing because we'd seen him for like two years he was on denial when he was on nile and when he was in tsm i think he was even in was he in complexity i can't remember if he went to complexity for a short yeah, time with Sanks. um but i i mean you you know the, we never saw this level out of him that we saw at epl so it was very much like where the fuck did this come from um and, and now it looks like it's kind of normalizing so it will be interesting to see how he plays moving forward um if i'm cloud nine though i thought they were one of the teams that missed out on the peacemaker sweepstakes when he signed with energy uh and that was short-lived that that happened very very quickly uh that he is no longer with energy so if i'm cloud nine i'm talking to him and i'm seeing if there's any way i think the the idea the way that peacemaker wants to play cs is probably very very different differently from how stewie's been calling and how stewie <coughs> ideally wants to play but but i'm talking to him and i'm trying to see if there's some kind of middle ground where we can both agree on a concept that would make sense for peacemaker to come in and kind of try and try something but i think it's becoming very obvious that if this team is not going to make a roster change then they need to at least hire a coach to bring in because i mean one of the problems i see with them as a team is i i think another reason why the automatic things leveled off is like first of all again it's not it would be very bizarre if he was some godlike player who was just buried in the scene somehow and then emerged and now is just fully fl blossomed you know and is going to go ham forever like, that would be kind of really weird because, again, it's not like he wasn't unknown. He had actually played in a number of teams and he just was like a slightly worse version of what he is now. But again, probably because the team wasn't as good. So my problem is that I actually think also that now teams have played Cloud9 enough. You get a, That's one of the reasons why you get that honeymoon period when you make new teams is because people haven't played this specific lineup. They don't know how you play yet. They're figuring out all the little kinks, etc. Whereas it's the same thing that happens, actually. If you ever notice the trend where a team get super good overnight on one map well then people just start banning it against you so now it becomes how good is your second best map you know you don't you don't get the option to play it anymore so the problem is you can't really judge the team in the early period when they have that like luxury of the surprise factor or they've got some strength that people haven't figured out is a strength yet that's one of the reasons why uh, this will sound harsh but the reason why you can't give automatic even when he has like a pro league performance the same kind of status as like shocks as like oh these are star players it's because the difference is people in europe have played shocks and his style of play for yes. three to four years and he still makes it work you know it doesn't matter you know you know what he's going to do you have an idea of how he's going to play the whole point is you can't stop him whereas the difference is there are other people where give you know given enough time i mean remember you are playing against some of the best minds in the world these in-game leaders these teams that adapt they're going to figure out how to at least exploit some of your weaknesses it's like i always used to use this example in basketball when you get some new star player breaks out it's the same thing right people don't know yet quite how to play him etc the difference is when someone like kobe's hitting the same number everyone knows exactly where he's going to on the floor and they know how to defend him and they know how to make it as hard as possible but he's still getting the same numbers so he's getting those numbers and they have more impact you know because it's harder so yeah that's kind of the analogy i'd give for cloud now like i don't see any problem with it it's just that i think that they've hit, hit the point where i th here's the upside i actually I'll, I'll go ahead and say this okay I think Cloud9 can make the major, but I think both Cloud9 and Team Liquid are going to do badly at this major. And I think that's a good thing because I think when both of them do badly, I think they both probably need a roster move. And I think that the availability of both rosters is what could be the savior of NA. Like if you fit, if you mix up some of those players, you can get some good teams out of that. I know you can. And obviously the optic guys are just chilling on the side. They can do whatever, you know. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's the crazy thing. Because I remember right after EPL, when when the kind of the conversation, or not right after EPL, when was it? I, mean, I think it was maybe after DreamHack, when it was like, how do you fix Cloud9? In my head, I'm just like, well, the first thing you do is go to fucking Optic and say, how much do you guys want for Mixwell? You need an upper. That's not going to happen anymore. That's not going to happen now. No. He's not fucking going anywhere. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think Liquid, Liquid at the Major is going to be interesting just because of Zeus. I, I would be very interested to see what he's able to do with this team having like two to three months with them before the Major. A lot of it with no league, with no league or tournament play. So there's no one really to scout them out or to see how they're kind of adapting. Um, so so that, that that's going to be fun. Cloud9, I think I'm actually kind of 50-50 with them on the Major. The issue is I don't like... I don't see a map that I can feel comfortable with them winning. Like, yeah, they're they're gonna pick Dust Two. I think I personally think their Dust True is atrocious, uh, despite the fact that they win on it at times. I think I think some of the the, the crazy thing about their Dust Two is it's like the best way to beat them is to go at 
Skadoodle at Long, who has an AWP, and any other team that has an opper in that position is like, yes, please execute into the A bomb site. Like the old Navi with Guardian is like, please yeah. come towards our opper at A. With Cloud9, it's kind of like, oh, this is going to be sketchy. This is going to be dicey. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's that's just one of the issues. I just don't see which map they're going to feel comfortable on against a lot of these teams. Well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is like the optic thing where optic's gotten better. So as a result, they're not going to be able to take players. I actually think that's what's because to now transition to talking about Astralis. I actually think that if you're Dignitas right now, you've got to be so grateful that Astralis has become so good. Because, you know, I told you that, you know, after the next major config will go to Astralis. Right. That was my what's what I, my prediction. I told you difference is if Astralis really is this good now. He might not, because now it's Astralis yeah. that doesn't need to steal him. That was the problem before, yeah. is that the law was always there. And I actually think at the moment, Astralis, I mean, we'll talk about them in a second. I think them and Dignitas are both set up to be pretty good teams. Like, I actually think that this last couple of events has proven out. Like, yeah, listen, Dignitas is legit. Like, don't put too much stock in the bad performances. There was only a couple for a start off. And even then, they were never, like, nightmarishly bad, you know. They were yeah. just not good. But the difference is they still have like a high ceiling, I think, that team. And in fact, at ECS, where they didn't have arguably their most stable, their best player, this tournament, okay, they didn't they couldn't do anything as a team, but this just showed you how fucking good config is, mate. Because the key thing about config is, what I respect about him is a lot of people who are aggressive players like that, when the team is going to shit, that's when they just kind of like tone it down a bit. Because you're gonna look like complete ass if you don't like hard carry the game if you do that like if you rush in there if you try to play make and there aren't people to follow you up and get those kills like you don't have your magic's boy there you're going to be in a situation where you're going to look like shit and you're going to you're taking a massive risk on your stats and how people perceive you but actually at e-league and in this tournament here he just continued to play like that mate he was still really good like he he's very very legit as a player so him and magic's when they're both back in dignitas i think dignitas is still going to be a top team in the world and that's why i made that prediction at e-league I, I still think they match up well with everyone in the world and i think once you get to the major because I think they're going to qualify for certain, you know. I think that's yeah, yeah. a, a pretty much a lock. I it think it's be. going to be. They're going to be one of the teams I think is a fun dark horse for the major. But okay, let's talk about Astralis now, because obviously Astralis, thanks to this weird period where SK got to be number one again, then NIP was ranked number one by some people. Now Astralis is ranked number one by some. Astralis now was overtaken and suddenly is number one ranked. What do you think of Astralis at the moment? Ah, uh, they they look and they look incredible. Um, they look very very good in terms of i mean they, they look good on all the maps obviously train has been a surprise for them and then the big thing that we saw was uh, i mean a lot of teams uh, you know have, have dropped off on train just a little bit especially a lot of the european teams i noticed like cloud nine likes playing it optic likes playing it um but but most of the european teams have shied away maybe because they just could never beat sk on it so why even bother but um that that's a map they certainly have over everyone else i think their map pool looks very strong um and, and i think in terms of five a five-man team like they they have a very deep roster outside of like glaive individually this team could pretty much man for man can match up at the moment i think uh zipnix is playing well dupree i think is the big one who has stepped up for me uh in a big way uh device on the op has looked so much better because i know that was a big question mark for me throughout this year was i didn't necessarily like device on an op not because he wasn't good with it but just because i thought it took away a lot of the ways they used him in the past like thinking back towards 2015 um, when you think, like, you know, a year ago, I thought they used him very, very well as like a one man off on the other side of the map, away from the team, to be an individual, find his one on ones, and just use that skill to win those duels. Um, but, but with the AWP, I thought he he was he's been very impressive in these past two two tournaments with it. So, I mean, you can't argue with the results, can you? They beat they beat some big teams uh, on the way here, and they've had, I mean, first place and second place, very similar to Optic. But just just the deepness of this lineup, I think, is perhaps the most impressive, and the fact that they all seem to be believing in Glaive's calling. Everyone seems to be very very happy with the kind of system, the kind of calling that he's doing at the moment. Yeah, I, here's the funny thing. My my ta people always want to make fun of those predictions I do where it's like a bold prediction in advance of the tournament, you know, someone's going to win this tournament. I think people are going to be end, are going to be so mad at the one I made where when Astralis lost uh, E-League, I said Astralis will win the E-League major. Now, that wasn't a joke. I wasn't just doing that to troll people. I'm going to double down on that. I'm going to make an article. I'm going to explain why. Now, I said it before they won CS, so Please. I'm in a position where it's not like I just picked it because they won this. But... That's the thing. At the moment, they really did. It's, the, it's okay. It's like a higher level version of the phase thing. The thing about phase was it never made sense that you could have that many good players and do so badly. 
So Astralis as a team, they're an even better version because they had very good players and they had good players for the roles. That's the part that didn't make sense. So now that Glaive's come in and he has done something, even if it's just psychological, you know, like people are on the mentally thinking they can do it now, you can see how when you unlock the potential of all the players in this team, they are like world beaters. They are like, you know, like put it this way, if they don't win the major, they're going to be like a legit top three team for six months now. I'm, t I'm telling you that right now because they not only have all the pieces in terms of the roles, they have like a fantastic map pool that looks fucking amazing right now. Like yeah. I can't even think of a bad map they've got, mate. Like maybe they won't play nuke. That might be it. That's about it. I don't think there's anything else, you know, like I think they can play almost everything else. And, and in an era when actually that is what has died off, the only other team with the super deep map pools is there's Dignitas, who's their domestic rival, and there's VP, that's it. Everyone else has kind of got shaky map pools, you know. SK's obviously died out. Uh, Na'Vi is non-existent map pool at the moment, you know. Like, that, yeah. they, they've got some massive tools in their back pocket at the moment. So, yeah, I think Astralis is going to be sick going forwards. I, th I think the scary part for, for any team at the moment is with how busy the schedule has been, we're about to take, what, a month, a month off? maybe a little over a month before the major begins. Uh, there's no question what this team is going to look like coming into the major. I mean, I still think they're going to be very, very good. But we don't, I mean, it's going to be insane to see some of these teams come off uh, no tournament play, no league play for a month. This might be the first major we've had in, in two years where this is the case, where there's just nothing leading up to the major. Uh, I mean, there's Dream Act Leipzig, I think, in January. I think it's the same time as yeah, but, uh, do you, I don't do you know who's going there. I don't, yeah, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think anyone's going to go to that, to be honest with you. I know WESG has Envy. Uh, it has Virtus Pro. Oh, that has Astralis as well, I think, actually, doesn't it? No, it has double... Dignitas with a standard. I think it's Dignitas with AZ. Wait there a sec. Let me check, though. I think they might be that. I might be wrong, it's, it's that. It's that event where you had to have all five players from the same country. Um, but but yeah, I mean, this is that's just the crazy thing. I mean, this is going to be the big question where... Um, the, I mean, I know a lot of teams are going to be planning to boot camp, but you, you have so much time off. It's around the holidays. So who's going to be coming back motivated? Who's not? Who's going to be playing well? Because um, at the moment, it seems very, with, with the amount of like up and down the different tournament winners, you kind of never really know. It seems to come down to who individually is playing well. Like, you know, Epicenter was was Magisk and, uh, and Config were godlike. EPL was fucking Stewie and Automatic were godlike. You know, we just had uh, E-League where it was Rush and it was Mixwell who were godlike. Tarek was up there as well. NAF had the good finals. And then we go to ECS and it's Device who's just dominant. So it's it's just coming down to, I think, with, with the schedule, individual performances are propelling these teams forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, it's, I actually find it funny. Just as a quick topic to address... So one of the things I find kind of weird about the device topic is in the last few months, like the final of E-League, you know, he did kind of disappear on the third map. Uh, in the semis, obviously, at Oakland, he was kind of a bit absent, you know. And here's the thing. He does get his stats for every tournament, no matter what. Like, you know, he'll tear up group stages. He just dominates that shit. But earlier in the year, he had kind of overcome the choking thing, right? The difference is he'd be the one who played well when they lost the game, right? Yep. Now he has had some flashes of that again. But... This is why I don't get why people go too far in saying that that means he's shit, though. Because what I've never understood about it, I've seen it happen in sports. Because the, one, the, the, the example I would give you, right, is I remember early in LeBron's career. This is literally what people used to do to him. He used to be a godlike player. Like, stats insane. You know, regular season game dominate. You know, most playoff games pretty good. But then what would happen is, yeah, he had some clutch games that he fucked up. You know, he wasn't as good or he wasn't impacting. Or you could see it on him. You, know, you could just see he was hesitant and he was worried about the moment. And the the whole thing is i agree that mean that does mean there's a vital difference still between you and the guy who is super clutch you know you and like the kobe or whoever it might be who who will close the game that is a big thing that you're lacking but what they don't seem to see the haters is like we well, do realize guys if that guy ever figures it out like device did at one point in time like lebron did then if he's got all the rest of the game and he ever adds some of that this guy's going to be like the best player like you know like the the game is there to be absolutely dominant in this game what do you think of Device in, in Astralis? Uh, he he has been so nuts. Um, and it's actually kind of a sin that we... Because I, I know we've, we've always talked about Cold Zera as like one of the most consistent stars because he has so few events with like a negative rating. I mean, he is, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, he is. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the sin that we're talking about Cold Zera like that. It's the, it's the fact that we talk about him like that and don't mention Device. Because if you go back to Gamescom of 2015... When it was uh, when they were still in TSM, he's only had 
I mean, yeah, he's only had two negative rated events since then. And they're not even bad. It's like 0.94 and 0.98, and, you know, like sub 1.0 rating. So that that's that's insane consistency. And and yeah, I mean, you can you can say what you will. He has always been someone who's dominated group stages. I don't think every single one of those has been like some god tier performance in terms of in terms of the event from him. But that's still like fucking next level. That is extremely hard to do over the time period, especially through roster changes. Considering they were TSM, then they were trademark or team question mark, and then they were and then they were Astralis. Um, he's been phenomenal, and I think. Uh, the the op seems to be suiting him very very well right now with how this team is playing, um, and I think the big key to it um, is, is not just device, but the fact that Kirby is also now seemingly like Glaive has figured out how to use him in this lineup you know, in a way that either Kerrigan didn't know how to do or didn't have enough of the respect from the team at that point to to figure out how to utilize him, whatever whichever one it was. Um, but but KRB being unlocked is is going to help Device moving forward because that's just another way to open up space for Device. I mean, they basically open up space for each other. Whichever one yeah. is getting that opening kill, the other one just gets unleashed to a whole new level. Yeah, because that's the key to me about Device. This is why I found it quite hypocritical that people were able to just like praise the fuck out of Cold Zero. Let's be real. The real reason they praised him was actually because he was winning. Like, he had stats and he was winning. Like, the key thing is, if you win, people assume what you did was right. If you lose, they have a very simplistic logic where it's like, well, if you're the star player, you must have somehow fucked it up. And so one of the problems I had was, when you praise Cold Zero, I've always praised him myself, said he's a fantastic player, but I've always said, but you can see where his team makes that more effective. Like, they, bas he basically becomes more effective because of what his team does. Now, the point of that is, like... Well, he's got he's got Taco buddied up with him on a lot of T sides where it's that like helps certainly yeah. yeah. So he's him got a good role player. He's got yep. fallen with him, you know. I mean, loads of those great train performances aren't as sick if there's no fallen because, for example, if if he's playing Ivy, okay, a Cold Zero, and you don't have if you have any other Orpa than fallen or like Prime Guardian or Outer, I'm just going to execute at mid and pop dog all day long flat smoke off the ivy and then fuck cold zero like what's he gonna do he's just gonna be sat there behind smokes wrecked or i'm just gonna bomb rush him at that position the problem is because you because that was what was so nuts about the train for sk in my opinion is that they had fallen and cold playing exactly the same quadrant of the map and so as a result you you wanted to think well just i'll go just go her. inside but then they had a really great set of role players inside so when he did go outside they had their two best players two really sick performers who could just straight carry that site and they just did all game long. that's why the ct side was godlike you know well the problem is device hasn't had anyone on that level for a while now yeah yeah, Caribbean yeah. looks like I mean, because because remember it was it used to be, and this was the thing with the Strauss before they dropped Kerrigan. People were like, okay, what's the issue with the Strauss at the moment? I always thought it was Dupree. I always thought it was like you know Dupree and Device are kind of like that combo that has lasted through some of like those these roster changes over the years, where it's like that was supposed to be the duo for this team. Um, and I always said like I don't think Dupree is is going to be good in that role. I think he's the one that needs they they need to bring in someone who can be that like second star for for device yeah. and now now that they have kier b then dupree all of a sudden doesn't have all that pressure on him to have yeah, those exactly. star performances and he's actually doing a very good job as someone who i think device statistically takes more opening duels because he's the opera and obviously that's you know especially on ct side that's the opening point of contact the majority of the time but dupree is one of the first players in on like t sides executes uh is doing very very well in that role as well so i mean th this whole team just seems to look very very much more comfortable individually uh in the different roles they're playing in but like, here's the thing, you nailed it when you said that about those stats. Here's the thing. Okay, it's true. He might have had like great stats on some of the group stages, but if you watched the game, you wouldn't be like, holy shit, he's dominating. Yeah. You'd just be like, oh, you got the stats, cool. But you, you you nailed it when you said that is incredibly hard to do. Like anyone who wants to say something, you know, like all he does is exit kill and get eco frags. Mate, you do realize I could tell, like, let's say tomorrow I made a challenge. So if you're get right or you're, I'm trying to pick players who have like, you know, like a, a passive playing style like Nicky does. If you're get right, if you're Magic's boy, if you're, well, let's call Cold Zero. Okay, here's the deal. If you just also do that, you know, you never have below like a 1.0 rating and you have to do it. You can, you can have like two in like the next 30 events that I'll give you as like, you can, you can fail twice. Right. Listen, Cold Zero might be able to do it. And by the way, his team has to be very good to help him. But uh, yeah, he was literally on one of the best teams of all time. But the difference is, some of those others probably couldn't do it. And they're amazing players. Like Magic's yeah. boy, a godlike player. Get right, one of the best players of all time. The difference is, that's how hard it is to do. They couldn't do that. 
It, it's insanely hard to do. It. Now, yes, it's not as cool, and maybe it's not as important as winning the big clutch game. Maybe it's not yeah. as important as closing out the game. That is true. But that's why I gave the LeBron James analogy, because here's the thing. I never used to watch LeBron James early and think like, wow, oh, he's the best player in the whole game. But I could see that he was insanely well-rounded. And I used yeah. to be like, listen, just because it's not flashy, it is really hard to even get your team into a position where then you could then close the game. You know? well, that, well, that's the thing. That's why you notice <coughs> it in like sports, like there was... Um... Always in baseball, there was like a pitcher who set the record for most home, home runs hit against him, and it's like that's that's obviously a record you don't want to hold. But it's like yeah. how 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 long do you have to be good enough to be playing in the game to have that fucking record? Like if your device, it's like if he's not this good, they're not put in positions to fail in the semifinals. They're not put in positions to fail in the quarterfinals. So I mean, you know, that, that's 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 the big thing is that he's still having so much success to get his teams to these points to then fail, which is what always takes the attention. But yeah, I think I think. Uh, device at the moment is playing extremely well. Quietly, he's done it for very consistently in a very long time. I didn't even really notice <coughs> this this level until I just checked these stats tonight. Um, but I, I mean, he's been an incredible player, especially recently. And it's only looking like it's it's going to get better for Astralis with with the way that they're playing at the moment. They have a deep map pool. Kirby, I think, is is unleashed. Zipnix is the big return to form for me, who's been doing very very well. Um, so this team is pointing in the right direction. The question becomes, as it does in every sport have they peaked too early for the major because i know you said you're gonna you're gonna pick them to win the major um yeah. it certainly looks that way now but i mean is there any you know when you look at the recent big events where we've had like eight different winners in the past nine events or whatever whatever the fuck it might be is that going to hold true for the major has astralis gotten good too early one ecs and is it now just primed for that that statistic to hold true and have a different winner for the major okay here's the thing i'll say no but for this reason Every other one of those teams that won events, except Virtus Pro, had obvious flaws when they won them. So Cloud9 won Pro League, and we immediately spent the next episode talking about how they might need a roster change. NIP won Oakland, and we all said, yeah, Nip Magic, you know, it was great, but that's not going to happen every time. Let me think of the other teams. Optic wins E-League, and guess what? They didn't win the next tournament afterwards. You know, there was obvious flaws, because, for, for example, we would have said, Naf had the game of his life, that probably won't happen, you know. There was an obvious flaw even when they won, before they failed. The difference is, for me, Virtus Pro and Astralis still haven't shown me those flaws. I still think, like, listen, they could underperform. I mean, it is just another tournament. Yeah. Right? Even if it's the major, you can just have a bad tournament. That can happen. But if I, if I, when I look at this next major right now, Obviously, maybe the qualifier could change this a little bit, but I think VP and Astralis are the only two locks to definitely go deep in that major. As long as they get like good playoff draws, I think both those teams are going super deep in this major because they, you know, they're so well rounded. They have the, the really good consistency. They have sick map pools. I think those are the two teams that have everything to to win this major. Yeah, cer certainly looking at it now. That that that's just always my question: is a month from now, especially with the current climate, where where you know there's there's so many upsets, so many different different tournament winners. Where were they going to be in a month? I think the interesting thing is Astralis, um, Virtus Pro to a certain degree, and a little bit lesser of a degree, and probably NIP to a certain degree, and then and then Optic. The big thing they have against other teams at the moment, and I am including Optic in that, which is which is crazy, but they just have deep rosters. You know, if you if you look at like the, if you look at Astralis, they have four players who can play extremely well, who can carry carry their team through a certain stretch. Optic has, you know, we've seen we've we obviously have the big three of Tarek, Rush, and Mixwell, but then we've seen Naf have big games, and even when he's not having the big game, he has impact. We see the same thing out of Stana's Law. For NIP, we've seen Freiburg and Exist return to form where they can carry their team through stretches, and then you have Force and Get Right who can play well. Uh, and then you have Pitt, who's just very consistent. Virtus Pro, they have Snacks as the star, but they have Biali who can have big games. They have Neo who can have big games, who's usually just consistent. Taz can is the same way as Neo, and Pasha is the same way as those three. So I mean you have these those four teams to me have like the deepest rosters in terms of at any one point any the majority for at least four players on that team can't carry their teams through a rough stretch or carry them through a half you know, I, you know, if you look at if you look at Dignitas, I think one of the maybe not weaknesses, but just the way the team is geared, you're not going to expect someone, um, someone. Why well, can't I even think of his name? Rubino. Rubino. The, yeah, I mean, you're not going to expect him to just carry right th right through an entire match. He's going to have a good game once in a blue moon, but he's not someone that you're ever going to pick out and say this is where he can do this. He's going to do it consistently. He's going to have that off game where he just carries them and just wins everything. Um, so, I mean, I, I think those in terms of that, those four teams have just have such a deep roster at the moment. That's all, I actually would put Dig in that company. I think like Dig's up there okay. in that reason. But okay, here's the one thing I'll say though. 
is that what another factor that I think goes in Astralis' favor is SK doing this roster move. Because yeah. I think the key thing about SK for me was, because I told you they're probably not going to win most of these other events, they definitely played spoiler at a bunch of them. Because I know there's some tournaments where people like NIP were like, why the fuck were you in my way? Like, I would have won this tournament if I'd have played Cloud9, you know, something like that. But they didn't get to because SK, here's the thing, SK could summon and offer the old magic to win like one big series. They just weren't going to win the tournament, you know. They, yeah. they couldn't keep it together for three series, you know. So I think actually SK l losing a player kind of neutralizes them. So they're out of the mix. And yeah, you look at who's left and it's only really like, you know, you VP, NIP, like actually this field's looking good for Astralis right now, you know. This is this is the perfect time, I think, for them. I will say, you're kind of right that the big layoff could do anything to any team, but the problem is because we can't know what it'll do, I have to just, yeah, 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 just yeah. assume it yeah. does nothing and see how it goes, you know. That, that's why it'll be interesting to see what team sign up for DreamHack Leipzig in January. Um, okay, right, quickly before the end of the show, let's just do a quick uh, qualifier prediction. And we won't go super in-depth because obviously we can't know what the matchups will be beyond the first round. And if you look at the way Swiss system works anyway, the first match sometimes doesn't matter because let's say you lose the first match and you're one of the top teams, you'll you'll have easy matches from there on out. You'll probably just win them all. So let's just instead pick how, who our eight teams that will get out is. So we'll go like this first of all. Just to shorten the discussion... I'm going to go ahead and assume that we both have uh, Dignitas House getting out. Yep. I mean, you know, super deep map pool, really consistent players. Again, this format actually is very forgiving as well if you're a really good team because you have to lose three times. Other people aren't just going to fluke you once and then get out, you know. So I'm assuming we both have Dignitas. We can skip that one. Right. Do we both have uh, NIP? I'm assuming yes, right? Yep, I do. Okay, you want to give a reason for NIP? Uh, I, I just, I just think they're going to be they're they're too good in terms of the amount of skill they have, and now I think this this new tactical element we've seen uh, recently from them. I just think they're one of those teams who's very very deep in terms of usually having three players show up to a match. So I, I just don't see enough threat in the rest of the teams to really be able to beat them to for them to lose three times in this pool. Yeah, so those two I think are obvious. Then I would say I'm assuming we both have Phase getting out. Yeah. I mean, FaZe is obviously a team where, first of all, they've done pretty well in group stages. You know, they've had pretty solid results. They also, amazingly, have a pretty solid map pool at the moment. And this actually is a perfect format for FaZe to get out of. Because with all those skilled players and the fact that you're going to play a minimum of three games, I think they don't, there's no way they're getting zero to three. Let's say you play a minimum of three games some of the stars are going to go off in these games. And also, more importantly, they're not going to be playing beasts in all these games. If they play yeah. lesser teams, they're going to tear them up. So I, I have FaZe getting out of this one. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the big thing. If they ever go up against like a Spirit or a Vega Squadron or a Tai Lu, uh, I mean, I think they're, they're just going to, I think they're just going to dominate. So yeah, I have them getting out as well. Okay, so there's three we've got so far. Right, what do you think? Okay, I guess we're going to pick Optic to get out? Yeah, I'm taking Optic to get out for sure. Okay, I'll, I'll agree with that one. I think that's fair um, enough. Immortals? Immortals, yep, I would have them as well. I think that's solid enough. I will say though, just as a as a one a note though, I I am a very interested, especially since they have the same lineup that they did fail the last two major qualifiers. Yeah, I want to I want to know if they somehow mess up here because we still are waiting for them to have that big result in the two hundred fifty k or more tournament. You know that is still a storyline that people forget about, but I think it still exists. I mean, that's one of the shocks of ECS that they just got straight up beaten by SK. Even SK, like it's like if you're Immortals, that's your time to beat SK. They've got the standing now. It's like right, you know, nothing can stop us now. You know, we beat them in the series and they lose. So I. I I will say I think they have a minor choke factor at this one, but I will I think they're a good enough team that they should get out when you consider eight teams get out. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, they, I mean they, they, this would be atrocious if they didn't. That would be like okay. oh good god. So that's five so far. We've got three more to go, Moses. Now this is where it gets interesting. Yeah, that is going to because because in now I think all of these names from here on out can make it, but they can also fail. Yeah. Like so, I'll start off with one for you, Cloud Nine. Do you have them getting out? Because you know what, Moses? I'm going to be bold. I'm going to say Cloud9 no. doesn't get out. I... Uh, fucking hell. I think they'll I think they'll get out. Okay, so Moses has Cloud9. I do not. Do I want to do that? Do I want to do that? Here's the thing. They're certainly a solid team. I know. But, I just... but, but my problem is, 
I think there's like they're the sort of team where the road bumps in this tournament could fuck them, and I see them having some problems against some of the better teams if they play them. You know, I think the big issue is they they just seem from from hearing stories from people who spoke to them, from speaking to some of the players after their exit at ECS, they just don't seem to have a whole lot of faith in themselves at the moment. <coughs> to be quite honest with you, but I'll take them. Why the fuck? Okay. Not? I've I've taken them in in dicier situations. We could say. All right. Right. So here's an interesting one. Envious. Uh, yes, I'll take Envious. Yeah, I'm going to take Envy as well. Because the problem I have with Envy is they can be pretty touch and go, but it see like I think for this sort of format that's going to work because they are, they have enough maps where they play well enough that I think they'll just get out on the odds. You know, like I think they'll be one of those teams that you know it takes like the five maps to get out, but they'll get out. I think they'll yeah. be able to do it. You know, here here's one crazy caveat, not not to the Envious part, but the Cloud Nine one. If if Cloud Nine doesn't make it, I think Renegades is going to do it instead. They would certainly be an upset potential, I think. Yeah, because I don't uh, think I don't think many people are going to have Renegades making it into the major. Yeah, I don't. I personally wouldn't have them doing it, but I I, I think they would be interesting. Certainly. Uh, what do you think of G two? Yeah, I think they've they've got to be the eighth team. Yeah, because I I actually think G two will make I, it as well. So yeah, yeah. I, can, I mean I can't see. Tough part is you have you have guys like Mouse Sports. I can't see Mouse Sports making it through it in, in three games, even though they're just best of ones. Unless unless Nico comes back to like his first half of the year, Nico, and is just able to carry them through some of these matches. I don't I don't see Mouse Sports being able to do it consistently. Um, so yeah, I have to take G two. I, I and I'd put them I'd put them in a similar situation as Phase, where you just say there's there's so much skill on this team that against some of the lesser competition, against like your your Ty Lu's, your, <coughs> your Godsense, your your Renegades, I think G two is just gonna be able to body their way through some of these opponents. Actually, wait a minute. Let me think. Because the problem is, if I don't have C9, I have to pick one of these other teams. That's the problem. <laughs> okay, here's what I'll do, okay? I'll just say that, I guess for this, for the purpose of this show, if I have to pick someone, I'll have to pick Cloud9 and make it through. But I will just say that I actually feel like when you consider a lot of those other teams, for Cloud9 have upset potential. So like Godsend, yeah. Mouse Sports, Hell Renegades. You know, one of these teams, Renegades. One, it only takes one of these teams getting that key win and that could be it, right? I do feel as though, I'll just say this, I think there's a lot of danger for a team like Cloud9 or if Immortal chokes uh, against these teams. These are the teams that can really do damage, you know? Do you... Let's let's do this because this could be fun. This is going the opposite direction. CLG versus Vegas Squadron. Who are you taking to win that? Who the fuck knows on that <laughs> one? That's just a, that is an abomination, right? <laughs> that's 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 the funny part. Are you gonna take? Would you take CLG to win that match? I'll probably just take Vegas Squadron. I mean, they're a real team, right? Why the? F- <laughs> <laughs> they played on land before, so I'll have them. I'll take Vegas Squadron. <laughs> I'm taking CLG in that Why one. Not? Jesus Christ! That's just complete garbage. My boy it? Kusa. My boy Kusa is coming back. He's coming back in a big way. So yeah, I, the problem is that like I actually think that maybe the surprise here, like if I had to pick the team that will that could shock everyone, it's probably Godsend actually. I think like out of the others, RNG I think just has weird upset potential. Mouse I know has some good players. They just played like ass recently. Tyloo I have no faith in. I don't think they can get yeah, out. I don't think Hell so. Raises is kind of an unknown quantity, but the problem is I don't think their ceilings that high personally. Like I see them as like the EU renegades. You know maybe they can upset someone here or there. But I think maybe Godsend could bear in mind you just have to be like the eighth team you know maybe they can be the team that sneaks out over a cloud nine see i think i think renegades can get through i i think their path if they can get into the major it's going to entirely depend on the matchups they get placed in and that's obviously the hard part that reason why we can't actually predict the whole way through this tournament but i think depending on who they get matched up with in the second round in the third round in the fourth round they can make it through it's just going to be entirely matchup dependent godsend would be interesting i just there just doesn't like I mean, we talked about this earlier. We don't need to go back into it. There doesn't seem to be enough firepower <coughs> surrounding Flusha. Pronax isn't there. JW isn't really there recently. So um, I, I I don't I don't have Godsend making it through. Unfortunately, that's going to be crazy as well if those guys don't make the major. Okay. Right. Well, we've got the qualifier in a couple of days, so that's going to be the end of this episode. 